Well, good morning. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Regan Newdorf, and my wife and I have lived in Caledonia since 2008, and our three kids have all been born here. And what's special about Caledonia for me, as I was thinking about since we've lived here, is it's the longest I've ever lived in one place. Anybody else? The longest you've ever lived in Caledonia or where you live right now? Anybody else? The longest you've ever lived. Okay. So on top of that, this is the longest I've ever been a part of a church family like this. So it's an honor and privilege to be able to speak to you here today. And speaking of our Gateway Church family, as Dave mentioned earlier today, today is our intergenerational service. And as a former youth pastor, I am all for age-specific programs and ministries, but it's super important for us also as the church to be intentional about these times together where we are knowing, loving, and serving God with all ages. So as a church, we've intentionally planned out five of these services for next year. But before we dive into the topic for today and our text for today, I want you to think just for a moment about other intergenerational or all ages experiences that you have. And what I want you to think about is what made them meaningful or memorable to you? Just think about that for a second. What makes an all ages or something special that you've been a part of meaningful or memorable? Is there one that kind of stands out the most for you? Well, as I thought about this question, what came to mind for me was a trip to the Cornerstone Music Festival in 2007 and in Bushnell, Illinois. If you've never heard of Cornerstone, it's a Christian music festival and it ran from 1984 to 2012. And in its prime, 20,000 people would attend and camp out on this old farm with over 20 stages spread out throughout the property. And this would showcase some of the best Christian indie rock, electronica, punk, metal, and hardcore. And yes, you heard me correctly, Christian, punk, hardcore, and metal. If you want to learn more about that, you can talk to me after. So I've been to this festival two other times, one time before this and one time after. But what was so special about this one is that my wife, Lindsay, and I, we were able to go with my brother and my sister-in-law, their two kids, who at the time were two and five around there, and my parents, these two kids' grandparents. So during the week, there are things for kids. There's all these different activities. There's different workshops and countless bands to choose from. And there was always something for somebody to look forward to. There was also bands like Switchfoot that everybody could go and enjoy together. Any Switchfoot fans out there? Anybody? I see that hand. All right. So these are such good memories. But what I remember the most is the sacrifice that my parents made to be there with us. So first, my parents are not campers. And this is the one and only time in their adult lives that they chose to go camping at a music festival with 20,000 other people. Second, they chose to go camping with us at this music festival where bands were playing nonstop from 11 a.m. to 2.30 a.m. every day during a long, very hot summer. There's certain times I would look over to my parents and I would just be like, oh my goodness, what have I done? Are they gonna make it? And then I would ask my brother, maybe this was a bad idea. But for my parents, no matter what they were experiencing, all I ever heard was this was the best idea. And why? Because they're just so glad that we could be together. And like I said, there was something for everyone, but what made it most memorable was that my parents didn't go to just get what they wanted out of this week, but rather they gave up they gave of themselves to be there. And you know what Jesus says? There is no greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for their friends. Gateway, this is what makes all ages experiences so amazing. As we think about these intergenerational services throughout the year, let's all agree to do this right now, to make them memorable and meaningful for everyone. Don't think to yourself, what am I going to get out of today? But instead, ask God. What can I give to you and others this week at church? Jesus also said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And this is one of the ways that we can tell that someone is actually walking with God because walking with God changes everything about us. Amen? And at our last intergenerational service, Pastor Sean spoke on this, and we learned that when we walk with God, we become more loving, we become more joyful, more peaceful. We grow in patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 
gentleness, and self-control. And this is the same for all of us. No matter what age we are, following Jesus will result in these good things. But how we walk with God during that time may look different from person to person or from age to age. And why is this? Well, because God loves us all equally, but he's created us all uniquely. And there are ways that he reveals himself and shows his love to all of us, but there are also unique ways that he speaks to each of us individually. Gary Thomas, in his book, Sacred Pathways, he says this. He says that God created you with a certain personality and a certain spiritual temperament. God wants your worship according to the way he made you. Now, a good way to think about this and to understand this, if we're trying to learn about our Heavenly Father, we can see examples of this in our earthly parents. So let's think about a parent who has multiple kids. So one kid might be competitive and active, while the other kid might be quiet and like to read. Okay? So for the first child, the parent may coach or cheer them on in games. And for the other, they may sit quietly or even just read a book side by side. Now, what do we know? The parent loves each child the same, but they have different needs and ways they express themselves. And this is our prayer for our intergenerational series, that we would all know how to best relate to God and hopefully also find new ways of drawing near to him. Just because something doesn't come natural to you, it doesn't mean it's not good for you. We can also learn a lot about how others connect from God and at different stages and st uh, places in our life. We may grow in and out of certain things, and that's perfectly fine, too. So, throughout the big God story, and recorded in the Bible, we can see tons of different ways that people walk with God, uh, and to be like them, we all have, so we, and like them, we all have a dominant or meaningful way that encourages us to know, love, and serve him. So let's take a few moments, we're going to explore some of these different ways. So Gary Thomas, the author that I previously mentioned, he came up with nine different ways that people predominantly walk with God. And he placed them in three different categories. So start to think about the ways that you walk with God and that are mo most meaningful. So he says, those who walk with God in wonder, those who are contemplative, and those who are action-oriented. So let's get those three up on the screen here. Those of wonder, contemplation, and action. Now before you say, oh, oh I think that's me, I'm gonna put up nine other images and I want you to try and guess what way of walking with God each image represents. So hopefully these larger categories that you see will give you a hint, but I want you to take 90 seconds. If you don't know the person beside you, introduce yourself first. If it's your kid, you should know them, just kind of saying that. But let's spend a few moments. Think about what these pictures represent and how do they speak to a unique way of walking with God. And then later we'll go through them, okay? So 90 seconds, here we go. You're allowed to talk to each other. Feel free. You don't have to whisper either. Go ahead. What do these images represent? If you're hogging the conversation, please give the other person a chance to speak. All right, you may have not gotten through all of them, but let's wrap it up here. Three, two, one, all right. So you may have not gotten the exact words and descriptions that the author used, but let's see how his descriptions line up with yours. So let's first start with those who are action-oriented. Anybody in the room feel like, yeah, I'm an action-oriented person? Okay, got a couple of hands there. So in the action-oriented category, we have caregivers, those that love God by loving others. We have activists, those that love God through healthy confrontation, clarifying the healthy. We have enthusiasts who love God through mystery and celebration. All right, what about our contemplatives? Anybody feel like they are a contemplative? 
here's what shows up in the contemplative ones. So if we go over uh, JP to the next slide. So we got that one, yeah, and then we've got our contemplative, there we go. So we've got intellectuals that love God with their minds. We have aesthetics that love God in solitude and simplicity. We have contemplatives who love God through their eternal adoration and their emotions. All right, that might have been some of the things that you pointed out in there, or maybe that's something that you really resonate with. And lastly, the wonder category. All right, so we've got naturalists. They love God in the outdoors. We've got sensates, which love God with their senses. And then we have traditionalists who love God through ritual and symbol. So there you go. Nine ways that we can walk with God. And like I said, we're going to explore a few of these throughout our intergenerational services this upcoming year. But for the rest of the time here today, we are going to look at just one. So what I want you to do is watch this next video and see if you can guess what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> Hi guys, I love being outside with my animals. It makes me think of God's creation, like this little guy. His name is Thunder. We watched him hatch from an egg. This guy's a chicken, and he's a small breed, and he's a silky. Hope you're spending some time outside in God's creation too. Bye! All right, thank you, Jaden, and thank you to your chickens. All right, so which one is it? Kids, anybody here? Anybody have an idea? What's the unique way that Jaden walks with God? Right here, what do you think? In wonder, yes, and then what's the specific action it says up on the screen? Oh, let's go back. One there, we'll get to there, JP, there. So, Jaden is a naturalist, okay? And among other things, but Jaden is uniquely wired to love God in and with creation. So what about you? Do you have meaningful times walking with God in creation? Or maybe you aren't sure. Maybe you're outside, but you don't know what actually is happening there. Is that actually time with God? So whether you do or don't know, let's do a quick survey. And I want you to raise your hand if you feel closest to God when you're surrounded by things like mountains, forests, or lakes. You feel closest to God when you're like that. All right, keep your hand up. Or... Join these people that have their hands raised if you feel cut off from God if you have to spend too much time indoors. Maybe a sermon or singing a song is not enough. We won't tell Steve, don't worry. You need to be outdoors, okay? Maybe if that's you, raise your hand. Or how about seeing God's beauty in nature? Is this more meaningful than things like just understanding new concepts, participating in a group, or being a part of a social cause? If that's you, raise your hand. Now, you might have some of these other things too, but this would be your primary way. Okay, so you can put your hand down. If you raised or lowered your hand at any point, you are most likely a naturalist or growing in this way of interacting with God through creation. However, if this isn't one of your primary ways to walk with God, and you see the outdoors as something rather to escape from than into, it doesn't mean you can check out right now. Okay, so let's stay focused on this together. So why is that? Well, first we can learn a lot about God and others from how they uniquely experience God and love and express it back to him. And even if you hate being outdoors or you just see it as something to consume or for recreation, the truth is God is still revealing himself to you through creation. A message that God reveals to all of us, to all of his creation, is actually called the general revelation. And this is what God does through creation. It continually points back to his creator, revealing truths about him. So Romans 1.20 says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, been understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. And in Psalm 19, King David, a man who obviously walked with God and was moved by his creation, he wrote this, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends 
of the world. Because of creation's amazing ability to point to God as our creator, the Bible says we don't have an excuse and need to work actually really hard to not know him through creation. And every time we look up to the sky, either in the day or the night, we receive wordless but powerful messages of God's greatness and glory. And speaking of the Bible, some theologians actually call creation the second book or the other book to emphasize how the Holy Spirit uses it to speak to us and to reveal truths about God to us. However, since creation is general revelation to everyone, it's kind of like the first book. If you don't have access to the Bible or if you've never read it, the first book is always there revealing God to you. And the Bible is special revelation from God, and it's compiled, compiled sorry, of many different direct revelations. This means that the Bible came from messages or experiences that were directly communicated to certain individuals, and then they're passed down and written down for us. Or they are testaments to supernatural experiences of God's work throughout history. And these things have been recorded down, handed down. But whether one book is first or second, it doesn't make one less or more important than the other. But what we do learn about God in nature, we should always line it up with Scripture. They can't contradict each other. One word from God does not contradict another. And actually, following the verses that we just read in Psalm 19, David makes this connection from how God speaks wordlessly through creation and to how he speaks through his written word. So after pointing out the heavens like we just heard, and they declare the glory of God, he writes this, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of, Lord, of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. And like the Bible, we can't engage with creation and not respond in some way to what God is revealing himself through it. Whether either growing closer in our walk with God or we're either walking further away from him. I'll say that again. We're either growing closer in our walk with God or we're walking further away from him. There's nothing in between for us. And I love what Eugene Peterson says in his book, Leap Over a Wall. He writes this. We can't get away from God. He's either there, you know, sorry, he's there whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not. We can refuse to participate with God. We can act as if God weren't our designer and provider. But when we refuse, our essential humanity is less. Our lives are diminished and impoverished. We can't be human without God. So, Gateway, what is God revealing to you through creation? What's unique about knowing, loving, and serving him in nature? We're going to dive more into these two questions in a few minutes, but let's check out this video where we ask Joel Flett and Pete Zimmerman to share about their small group experiences and how they walk with God, with each other, and outdoors. I uh, started meeting up with a small group about six years ago. It was a good time to just connect with some other guys who had young families, and we started meeting up at McDonald's. Then COVID came along and we met on Zoom and wasn't as good. Um, then after that, we um, started coming over to the trail when we could just meet up outside and found that that was a really beneficial place to meet up because when we get outside, everyone's stress level comes down a bit. We're enjoying the sunrises often. Even if it's raining, we'll still come out and uh, we've met up in the snow a few times. It's, it's been great, even in good and bad weather. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah, I mean, you hear about it in culture, but it's just not something. Having an opportunity to connect, sometimes it was at McDonald's, sometimes at Tim Hortons, uh, but it seems like our fallback often has been coming back to the trail. And so anytime weather permits, we're happy to get out and just enjoy a nice uh, quiet morning together before our uh, busy work days begin. So that's kind of been a real blessing and encouragement for all of us, I would say. I usually midweek uh, we'll send out uh, a message, perhaps put forward a little devotional or a scripture reading. We get down to the trail bright and early on Friday morning, 6.30. When you're here, you know where you're, you're supposed to be. It's a good chance for us to just kind of walk, talk, connect, read and go through the devotion and scripture, stuff that stuck out to us from those passages, and then also to take time at the end of our session together just to gather Riverside and 
pray for one another, share concerns and trials that we're having in our lives. I find that when we connect here at the trail, it's just a place to kind of slow yourself down a little bit. There's a quote I read once in a book, uh, it's only when we slow our lives down that we have a chance to catch up to God. And that one's always stuck with me. Just being surrounded by His creation, the beauty of His nature and everything, and uh, it, it provides a good environment, I would say, to connect with each other, to clear your mind, to hear what God has to say to you, and to be able to pray for others as well. All right, thank you, Pete and Joel. And allow me to ask you a similar question that we asked them. How is God inviting you to walk with him in creation? How do you think your life would be different if you intentionally carved out time to be with him in nature? And how do you think you would respond as you spend time with him? Well, like I said, that's going to look different for all of us, but there are some pretty common ways that people tend to respond to God in meaningful ways through creation. And if you're not natural at being a naturalist, but feel like you're in a rut spiritually or having a hard time hearing God's voice, I recommend, I recommend trying these three responses as conversation starters as you walk with God in nature. So first, we can respond in awe and simply say, wow, this is amazing. And God, you are amazing. Then we can actually study what we're experiencing and ask God, how is this possible right now? Or why? And lastly, we can look for meaning. What does this mean, God? What we're experiencing together, what we're seeing. How do the changes of the seasons or a beautiful sunset tell us more about you? God, what are you saying to me through a brisk fall day or a crazy thunderstorm? Actually, we can see these three responses in another psalm that King David wrote. And in Psalm 8, we also get another glimpse of his ability to connect with God in nature. However, we also see this strong contemplative side of David. So you may say, hey, I am really engaging with God well in nature, but there are other parts and other practices that I love, and that's wonderful. However, we also see with David um, what this means and how come it's so spiritually impactful for him. So there's so much meaning that comes in this psalm. So if you have your Bibles with you, either in print or electronically, and if you didn't bring one and you want one, you can just raise your hand and our connecting team can get that to you. So we're going to be going to Psalm 8, Psalm 8, and that's in page 773 in those blue Bibles. And on your own, if you uh, open your Bible up to the middle, you'll get as close to Psalm as possible. And kids, if you're looking for, look for the big eight. Those are the chapter numbers, and we're going to start in verse 1. So Psalm 8, page 773. All right, I'll wait for the pages to slow down. I hear a few people still going. Okay, it'll also be up on the screen, but I encourage you to read along in the text in front of you. So David writes, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So we see immediately here with David, he is brought into a place of awe and wonder. And he actually starts and ends this portion by repeating that same line. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And he actually goes on to say, you have set your glory in the heavens. And again, another statement of awe, but then he starts to study what he's seeing. What do these skies do? Well, 
He says they cause children to respond in praise and worship and to fight back against the powers of darkness. And then he actually tries to explore the meaning of it all. Well, God, when I consider your heavens, the vast expanse of your creation, I can't help but feel so small. Why do you love us, Lord? Why do you care? Now, in this moment, I don't know if David heard like a specific word from God or saw an image or just had a feeling, but it seems like as he's gazing up in the sky and asking God these questions, he gets a direct response from God. Because when he's feeling small and insignificant, all of a sudden he's encouraged and lifted up and he exclaims, God, you created us with love and purpose. You made us lower than just you and the angels. God, we have meaning because of you. We are your creation. But we're just not any part of creation. We've been set apart as humans and been given a special responsibility to care for all the earth and everything in it. <laughs> wow. God revealed all of this to David just because he looked up into the sky. So friends, when you're in creation, what do you think God wants to say to you? Now, you may not be inspired like David to write a song, but why don't we spend some time reflecting on God's creation in this moment and allow God to speak to us through a few images of our beautiful Canadian landscape, which he's not only given to us to enjoy, but he's given us a responsibility to care for it. So while we're watching this, the band is going to start to play, allow the images just to be a conversation starter with God, and then we will go into a, a time of worship. But for a true naturalist, you may be looking at this, and every landscape you see now may be torture for you. You just may be like, man, I just want to go there. But we know that wherever we're at, we all can respond to God in awe and reflect on what this actually tells us about God and ourselves. So feel free to respond as you see fit, stand, pray, sing. But if you need some help getting to that place of awe and what words to say, we'll be singing the song, How Great Thou Art, and the lyrics will be up on the screen. So allow these words to stir in your heart a sense of awe and wonder. Now, before we start, we're going to just read these words adapted from Psalm 8, one together. So I'm going to put these up on the screen. And let's all read this together. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of Canada. Amen.
that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on that cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died. Thank you for joining. Remember in Psalm 19, when David was inspired by gazing up into the sky and his awe of God's glory, this wordless and speechless general revelation that he receives causes him to study and reflect on God's special revelation, his spoken and written word. And similarly, this song that we just sang, we see that the composer of How Great Thou Art is inspired like David and is in awe of God's creation and his power and is displayed throughout the universe. And like David, God reveals a deeper truth to him. And he points the composer to another special revelation, but not the written word, but the living word. Jesus, the living word. Oh, then sings my soul, my Savior, God. To thee. And friends, all of creation points to Jesus. Why? Because he is the ultimate expression and revelation of God's invisible qualities. All of this being made known through him. And everything we can learn about God and how to walk with him is made possible through Jesus. And that's not just through nature, but every unique way that God has wired us to walk with him. And these nine practices or pathways are nothing without Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. Every part of life is designed to be accompanied with God. As humans, we were made to walk with him. And in Colossians 1, 15 to 20, it says this. The Son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, 
all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And then down to verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Friends, creation points to our creator God, but it also points to our recreator and savior God, Jesus. He's our living word, the ultimate revelation and image of God and our living hope. And so before we venture out into nature and practice walking with God, may the image of the bread and the juice remind us of Jesus' power and presence in our lives. It is only through him that we can truly know God and be known by him. And as we said at the beginning of our time here together today, a memorable experience is far more meaningful when we give of ourselves. And because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, Everyone and everything finds its purpose and meaning in him. So friends, as we participate in communion today, may we be reminded of that sacrifice. May we take these visuals and images with us to say, Jesus, what does your presence look like in my life as I walk with you in creation and in all aspects of my life?